Everyone, the last idea we want to talk about in this section is the conservation of charge, meaning that if charge can only be transferred from one object to another, a charged object has a high potential or high voltage, and charges, given the chance to move, will move from high volts to low volts. So that's what the wire is doing here. It's connecting these two spheres, one charged, one uncharged, and they'll do that until there is no potential difference. Not necessarily the same charge, but as long as the volts on each of these are equal. So to show an example of this, let's try our own practice problem. So here's the setup. We've got a sphere, radius one, that's charged to 100 volts. It's five centimeters in radius. And we've got our two, which is 10 centimeters in radius. The first thing we need to know is how much charge do we have available? Well, since it's a sphere, we can treat it as a point charge and use KQ over R to solve for the charge on sphere one. So put in your values, you should get a Q around about 5.56 times 10 to the minus 10th coulombs or about 0.55 nano coulombs. So that's the total charge that we have available when we connect one of these spheres to the other. Now the other sphere isn't charged, it's neutral, so it has a zero volt potential. So if we have 100 volts and a zero volt, what we can do when we connect them with a wire, given the chance, charges will flow from high volts down to low volts. So what we have to do is see how much charge is gonna go on each sphere. So the way we can set this up is that the total charge we know is equal to charge one plus charge two. And to solve for how the charges are gonna redistribute themselves, we can look at the ratio of their voltages because it's not so much that each sphere is gonna get the same charge, it's that each sphere is gonna reach the same potential level. So I can say that voltage on sphere one must equal the voltage on sphere two, or KQ1 over R1 must equal KQ2 over R2. The nice thing is that there's a Coulomb constant on both of these, so I can eliminate that. And I can solve for charge one or charge two in this case, doesn't really matter. Let's solve for charge one. So charge one would be the ratio of charge two multiplied by R1 over R2. So I'm gonna divide those two radii to get how the charges redistribute themselves. So in this case, since radius one is five centimeters, and radius two is 10 centimeters, that means that charge on sphere one is gonna be half that of charge two. So when I put that back into my formula, I put Q1 over here, so I now have total charges Q2, R1 over R2 plus Q2. And since we know that this is really <laughs> half of charge two plus charge two, that means I've got about three halves charge two, and if I wanna solve for Q2, Q2 is gonna say that I have two thirds of the total charge. So since I know my total charge was about, I said 0.55 nanocoulombs, two thirds of that charge is gonna reside on sphere number two. So if there's two thirds of the charge on sphere two, that means there's only one third of that charge sitting on sphere one. So from that, we're able to figure out exactly how much charge has redistributed itself. You can see that sphere two is larger so since it's larger, it's able to hold on to more charges than the first sphere and exactly two thirds of the total charge while this holds on to one third of the total charge. So if you did your math for that, you could say that sphere one holds on to about 0.18 nanocoulombs while charge two holds on to about 0.37 nanocoulombs of our total charge we found from before. Now that we know the charge on each sphere, we can figure out their voltage. You can solve for V1 or V2, doesn't really matter, <laughs> as long as you use the right radiuses and the right charges. Put it in your values there, you should get around 33.3 volts. And so both spheres have come to the same potential level when all is said and done, all the transfers happen. Now something you could have done without connecting these two with a wire is just simply touch the spheres. Touching the spheres, since they're both conductors, allows the charges to move just as easily. And you can see that we went from 100 volt all the way down to 33 volts, but the sphere that wasn't charged rose its potential from zero to 33. You can see that transfer happens either way. One sphere is gonna decrease its voltage while one sphere increases its voltage. In order for them to have the same voltage, they would have to have the same exact radius. Now, another thing that could be asked here is what about the electric field strength on each of these spheres? Well, to solve for electric field, we can treat both of these as point charges and find the electric field strength as KQ over R squared. 
Since we know the charge and we know how big the radius is, we can solve for each of their electric field strengths. So when you do this, yes, sphere two has a larger a quantity of charge but it also has a much larger radius and when you have a much larger radius squared on the bottom the electric field strength on sphere one is much greater than the electric field strength on charge two and one other thing you could ask them what about the charge density well charge density is charge per unit area again we know that the small sphere has less charge but it has a much smaller area and since area is based off of r squared the charge density, charge density of sphere one is also much greater than the charge density of sphere two. So that's what we're kind of seeing here with this uh, teardrop shape. You've got two different radiuses, one at radius A and one at radius B. The electric field lines down here at the tip of that teardrop are much stronger than the electric field lines way over here. That's because there's more charge packed on a tiny, tiny area and that gives you a very, very strong electric field. This kind of goes back to that whole coronal discharge and when charges get on the top of a lightning rod, they get so packed in there that their electric field strength is enough that it can actually repel charges into space and try to discharge the clouds. We can get a very high charge density, but the entire surface of this teardrop shape is the same voltage or the same electric potential. And that's what we're showing you here with the water example. With the water example, you can see that that beaker on the left has a much higher voltage or higher potential than the beaker on the right. And the water is going to flow from high to low potential. You can see that basin two, the one on the right, is a much larger area. So water is going to flow from the high potential to the low potential and water will stop when they reach the same gravitational potential level. Here I could even put in some food coloring so you can see where the water is actually flowing. So if I go from the high potential, it's going to go up that straw and move from high voltage all the way down to low voltage. You can see the red food dye is now filtering in to the bigger sphere. Now when these two level off in the end, the beaker on the right is going to have a lot more water in it than the beaker on the left. So in terms of water, if we're gonna equate that to charge, you're gonna have a lot more charge in the larger sphere than the smaller sphere. But due to electric field strength and charge densities, less charge on less area is actually a stronger field than more charge able to spread out on a bigger surface area. So that's why the charge density is so low on that bigger beaker. So I hope this helps you visualize how charges want to move and know that charges will always flow from high volts to low volts. So we can use these ratios to figure out how the charges will redistribute themselves and where locations of equal potential end up being.